And again, I hope that's our prayer constantly, that the Lord's light will shine in our communities and uh, across this country of ours. We need the light of the Lord, don't we? Can I take you back to the reading, which is in Luke and chapter 8? <clears throat> and I'm just going to go through it a few verses at a time. <coughs> so again, it's still on page 1037. So Luke 8 and verse 1, after this Jesus travelled about from one town and village to another, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve were with him, and also some women who had been cured of spirits and diseases. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Joanna, the wife of Chusa, or Cusa, the manager of Herod's household, Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So we read here that Jesus toured the whole region of Galilee systematically, visiting many cities, towns and villages. What he was doing, I believe, was reaching as many people as possible in preparation for his final appeal to them. Now, the one thing about Jesus was that he was totally committed to his work, the work of preaching the full gospel message. And the full gospel message is not only evangelism, but it's also healing and deliverance. Everywhere that Jesus went, he walked. Only once is it recorded that Jesus rode on a donkey and that was when he rode into Jerusalem five days before his death. It's interesting that donkeys were much used at that time in the country as a means of travel, and they were used by more humble folk. Horses were kept for the use of more wealthy and renowned men. And so walking by foot was a very humble but a very tiring way to travel. But this is the way that Jesus chose. It meant that he could easily stop anywhere to minister and talk to, to folk along the way. And of course, he was also able to teach his disciples as they walked along. Now, it meant that he had to be in prime physical condition which is why I'm sure he conducted his ministry on this earth between the ages of 30 and 33. As far as I can remember, that's when I was in my prime physical condition. <laughs> but so long ago, I can't fully remember, but I think I'm right. Now, it's interesting that it says the 12 were with him. Now, does this imply that previously they had not always travelled with him? Sometimes it would appear that Jesus went to places perhaps on his own. Maybe some of the disciples carried on doing work in self-support. But what we do know is that the four fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James and John, who Jesus had told to follow him, they had left their fishing nets and their boats and they had fully committed to following Jesus. And notice where it refers to the 12 there in those verses. It uses a capital letter for the 12, which clearly denotes that it was the 12 disciples that were chosen and called by Jesus. And invariably you find in the Bible when someone has been specifically called by God for a specific purpose, a capital letter is used denoting the importance of the calling. And there in verse 3 that I read is a reference to Joanna, the wife of Cusa, Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. And so it, and so it shows that the news of Jesus had reached Herod's palace 
and at least one person connected to the palace had been converted. Now, Jesus had many women among his followers, and they often accompanied him on many of his journeys, ministering to him, particularly, I can imagine, in the supply of food. And they also sacrificially used some of their own means, their wealth, to support Jesus and the ministry that he was conducting. And I would say, never underestimate the importance of women in Jesus' ministry. Is there an amen to that? Some of you are not sure. Amen. Good for you, Barbara. <laughs> Something just to think about, maybe. Some people have a misconception that Jesus was poor. We sing about Jesus being poor and humble and, and meek. But I think that was not necessarily so. Remember, Joseph, his earthly father, had his own building business. In the Greek, the word for carpenter is actually wrongly translated. It actually has a wider meaning. It literally means a builder or a man of many trades. So I don't think Joseph was simply a carpenter. He had much wider skills than that. <clears throat> now, we know that Je uh, Joseph died sometime before Jesus' crucifixion, which is why when Jesus was on the cross, Jesus asked John to take care of his mother. And it says that John took Mary into his own home to be cared for. You can check that out. It's in John chapter 19, verses 26 to 27. Now, Jesus, being the eldest son, would almost certainly have had the double portion of the inheritance of his earthly father's building business. Remember also that when the, the wise men, as we call them, from the east, when they came to visit Jesus a couple of years after his birth, they brought gold with them. We also know that Joseph, uh, Judas Iscariot held the money bag from which we read that he stole on a regular basis. <clears throat> now, I've no doubt that the money that was accumulated and carried in that money bag was used to meet the ministry costs, to help the poor that Jesus and the disciples and the women met every day. And so maybe it is a big misconception to regard Jesus as being poor. One thing is for sure, and that is that he would have used the money aright and he would have kept everything in a right balance. Now, coming to the main thrust of this passage in, in Luke chapter 8, which we refer to as the parable of the sower, actually it might be better called the parable of the soils. And you find that this parable is included in Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels, which I think indicates the importance of this particular parable. It is for sure an outstanding example of Jesus' way of teaching. And we know that Jesus used parables often. The New Testament actually records about 40 parables that Jesus used. And these parables would get the interest of listening people because everyone likes a good story. But above all, these parables teach vital spiritual truths about the kingdom of God. And these stories that Jesus told, these parables, could be easily remembered, and they were a good way of both presenting and preserving the truth. But you see, a person's spiritual condi condition often determined how they would understand what Jesus was saying. And the still the same is true today. For those who are really going on with the Lord, who are in close fellowship, relationship with him, 
you find that such people have a greater understanding of the word of God. Why? Because they're full of the Holy Spirit. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit to bring understanding to us as we read and study the word of God. So if a person is full of God's spirit, walking closely with God, then they are much more likely to understand the teaching of the Bible. So that's a challenge for each one of us. Now this parable of the sower has to do with the way the word of God is received in the world. It gives a clear contrast between mere profession of faith with those who are genuinely born-again believers who have the Holy Spirit and who value and receive the word of God. And the point of the parable, I believe, is that the condition of the soil, that is the receptacle, that determines the potential or viability of growth. Those who have become complacent, apathetic, and lazy, and sadly I think there are many people like that in the West in these days, such people are not likely to receive the word of God with benefit. Just going to keep my finger in Luke 8. I'm just going to turn quickly to James chapter 1, which I think is a good sort of commentary on what we're saying. James chapter 1 and verse 22. James spells it out very clearly here. James 1 verse 22, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forget what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. And as we study the word of God and as we allow the truth of it to penetrate into our spirit, and as we, the second stage, as we obey what the word of God says, God will bless he will pour out a blessing because it clearly says in the word of God that obedience brings a blessing. And I don't know about you, but I want as many blessings from God as I can get because I need them. I need all the help that I I can get. So this parable of the sower has to do with the way the word of God is received. And the parable that Jesus told, I think, was fairly easy to understand. During the planting season, it was a common sight to see men scattering seed by hand in their fields. And they cast the seed over many different types of soil. So if we just go back to Luke in chapter 8 and verse 5, So the farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the air ate it up. Now the meaning of this is given in verse 12, where it says, Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so that they may not believe and be saved. Now, except for a a few main highways, there were only paths or tracks going across the fields. These paths would be trampled hard. Many people would walk along them. And that type of path would be unable to receive the seed. The seed would simply lay on the top of the soil. Now, the birds here represent Satan and his his demons who come along and take away or eat up the seed before it can be received into a heart, into the heart of a person. 
So a person, this is talking about a person who hears the word of truth but does not accept it into their heart. In other words, they hear it but then they ignore it. They don't do anything with it at all. And then Satan comes along with his lies, convincing the person that it's not really important. They don't really have to take any notice of the word of God. They can forget about it. They'll be quite all right. And they can just get on with enjoying and living their life. Now, this seed that falls on the pathway, it's talking about unbelievers. These people do not receive the seed. They do not receive the spirit. So they are not born-again Christians. Now, sadly, the majority of people fall for the lies of Satan in this respect. There is a, a verse that I often refer to, but it's one of the most important verses in the Bible. It's in Romans 1 and verse 20. And I would draw it to your attention because it's particularly important when you're talking to non-Christians or maybe talking about Christianity to non-Christians. And people often say, oh, well, I'll be all right. I've lived a good life. I've done this or that and the other. And then there are other people who say, well, there's lots of people living in the world who've, who've never heard the truth. They've never heard the gospel message. Now, Romans 1, verse 20 spells it out very clearly. It says, For since the creation of the, wor the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. What it's saying is creation itself speaks of God. It speaks of the creator. And by looking at creation and realizing it's speaking of a superior being, a creator, speaking of God, people actually have the gospel message. And so that's what it sa why it says, such men, all men, are without excuse. So no one can say, stand before God at the end of their days and say, well, I never heard, I never knew. Because creation itself speaks of God. And they had an opportunity to make that decision to give their lives to God. So everybody has that opportunity to make that vital decision about Jesus Christ. The second type of soil is the rock, which is in verse 6 of Luke 8. So some fell on rock, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. And the explanation is given in verse 13. Those on the rock are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. Now, Palestine was and is still a very stony country. And this seed here is talking about the seed that didn't fall on actual bare rock, but it fell on thin soil that was covering a layer of rock beneath. And the warmth of the rock would cause the seed to sprout up very quickly, but the soil, with the sun blazing on it, would dry out very rapidly, and so the young shoots would soon wither. Now this shallow soil represents people who seem eager and keen to receive Christ's message to start with, but they soon drift away because their commitment is just superficial without any real depth at all. They're very enthusiastic in the beginning, but it soon wears off. They receive the word, they acknowledge that it is the truth, but as soon as tough or testing times come, they've got no roots, there's no real depth, there's no going on with the Lord in their walk, and so they soon 
fall away. And what it means is that they have earned very few rewards because their initial enthusiasm and faith, if you like, is only for a short time. Basically, they go away from God very quickly. And then the, the third type of soil in verse 7. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Again, the explanation is given in, given in verse 14. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way and are choked by life's worries, riches and pleasures, they do not mature. So this is representing those who both hear and receive the word of God, but they lack the conviction and the single-mindedness to apply it to their lives. And so they become completely unproductive in terms of producing any good fruit. It's what James was referring to, that you've got to hear the word and actually adopt it, apply it to our lives. These people here, they hear the word, they know that it is right, but they do nothing with it at all. They are consumed with the worries and cares of life, as well as with seeking earthly riches and pleasures. You see, having a divided mind <coughs> stops spiritual maturing. We can't have a foot in both camps. We can't have one foot in the church and going on with the Lord and the other foot in the world. And I get very disappointed, I have to be honest, going to many different churches. I do come across so many Christians, Christians inverted commas. They're very much taken up with earthly riches, bigger house, bigger car, this, that and the other. And that is their main focus. Whereas really our main focus should be on the Lord because we belong to him. You know, as we take communion, we are told to remember, remember what Jesus has done for us. And so we've got nothing of ourselves. It's all about him. And sadly for some people, some Christians, that doesn't seem to apply. They get the wrong priorities in life. James comments on this. I'll just go back to James and chapter 1 and verse 6. James 1 and verse 6. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all that he does. So you notice that a person who one day is saying, well, praise the Lord, everything is good. God is blessing me. It's wonderful, this Christian life. And then the next day he's saying, oh, I feel sick. Why is everything happening to me? My pension's not as big as I thought it was going to be. My bank balance has got lower. Oh, woe is me. Next day, oh, God is good. Praise the Lord. Next day, oh, things are terrible. A double-minded man. And we can't be like that because, you know, you can't be one thing one day and the other another thing because it makes you very rocky and unstable. We as Christians, we've got to trust the Lord all the time, not just when things are going well. So double-minded actually means having a divided allegiance and uncertainty about which way to go, whether to follow the ways of God or the ways of the world, and what being in such a shali brings ongoing conflict within. Paul talks about it in Romans 6 and Romans 7, where he talks about this constant battle that he had between the spirit and the flesh. This constant battle. And we, I would suggest we all have that, probably every day. Our flesh wants to enjoy pleasures and take it easy. 
look after number one, but the Spirit says follow the Lord. Give him first place. Give him the honour. You see, for a a person that is double-minded, that sort of double allegiance, the result is that no good spiritual food can be produced. You know, before 1948, before Israel became a nation once again in its own right, Israel was very much a desert. But a mighty miracle took place when Israel, 1948, was restored to being a nation. There was an amazing transformation. The land became fertile once again. And it's a wonderful testimony to the work of God and his love for his nation, Israel. And to give you just an example of the extent of the transformation that has taken place, probably some of you know this, but Israel, which is roughly the same size as Wales, is now the third largest exporter of fruit in the world. Can you imagine the size of Wales, third largest exporter of good fruit in this world? Back in the days of Jesus... The soil was also very rich. When it was properly irrigated, it produced large crops. And this is what I'm sure Jesus had in mind when he said, there is only one soil that produces good fruit. And he emphasized the need to hear the word of God with a good and a right heart. And that is a heart with right motives that is open and sold out to God. And we can see this in verse 8 of Luke chapter 8. <clears throat> Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. When he said this, he called out, He who has ears, let him hear. And the explanation is given in verse 15. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So a heart that learns and studies the word of God, who loves the word of God, who respects it, and applies it to everyday living, and standing on the word of God, perseveres, God will bless and God will open a way because such a heart, such a person like that will produce good fruit and good fruit is to the glory of God. And people believe many things but you know God's truth is worthy of ultimate belief. The final scripture, just coming to an end, just want to go to John and chapter 8. John 8 and verse 31. To the the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that word free refers to freedom from the bondage of sin. And so obedience to the Lord, that is knowing and applying his truth to our lives, it leads to fellowship with him. It leads us to a place of absolute protection and more than that, experiencing his wonderful love, which he has for each one of his children. So let me finish by saying and asking the question, and I ask myself, what type of soil am I? What type of soil am I? Do I love the word of God? Do I take it into my heart? Do I do my very best with the help of the Holy Spirit to apply it to the way that I live? I hope the answer to that is yes, and I hope the answer for you, my dear friends, is yes. The word of God is eternal and it is so, so important for the way that we live our lives 
in these very dark and dangerous days, days when the world is looking at us and we are the living testimony to the gospel of the word and the life of God. Hallelujah. God bless you. Let's sing our final song, shall we? And give the praise and glory to the Lord. And let's rejoice in the fact that the Lord has given a land of good things. And as Christians, we have a sure and certain hope. We have eternal life, and we're going to live that life in the presence of the Lord, and he's prepared good things for us. Hallelujah.